their majesty with one of the wonders of the world, the pyramids. Ancient Egyptian religion holds that Pharaoh is not only a man and a king, but an immortal god. When he dies, the monarch is outfitted for eternity with food, clothing, and magnificent treasure, not out of vanity, but to ensure the king's passage to the afterlife. But for some Egyptians, greed overwhelms faith. Every pyramid, no matter how carefully guarded, is robbed almost immediately. In 1570 BC, the burial site of the pharaohs is moved up the Nile to a desolate canyon that will become known as the Valley of the Kings. The site is 400 miles south of the Great Pyramids of Giza. Tombs are cut into solid rock, then hidden under mountains of debris. The penalty for tomb robbery is death, but even here, the lure of golden treasure is too great. The Valley of the Kings is looted and sacked. As the majesty of ancient Egypt wanes and the empire crumbles, the valley is bypassed by time. But then, another wave of invaders arrives. Men like the American Theodore Davis find the remnants of plundered tombs. In 1914, Davis gives up, declaring that the Valley of the Kings holds no more secrets. Howard Carter will labor for the next eight years to prove him wrong. Carter is a young English artist who first comes to Egypt in the 1890s. He absorbs the skills of archeology span he imagines the valley in the age of magnificent burials and desperate crimes. It's 
strange sights the valley must have seen and desperate the ventures that took place in it. One can imagine the plotting for days beforehand, the secret rendezvous on the cliff by night, a bribing, drugging of a cemetery guard, the desperate buttering in the dark. By providing his mummy with the elaborate and costly outfits which he thought essential to his dignity, the king was himself encompassing his destruction. The temptation was too great. For years, Carter watches the fortune seekers come and go. He yearns for his chance in the valley, but he doesn't have the money to mount a full-scale search. Carter is not a transient treasure hunter. He learns Arabic. A man of few friends who never marries, Carter chooses a life apart. In 1908, Carter's life is at a low end. He's selling paintings to tourists, but he never gives up his dream to thoroughly excavate the Valley of the Kings. country castle, the man who will share Carter's quest, George Edward Stanhope Molyneux Herbert. The Lord Carnarvon has developed a passion for Egyptian art. He dabbles in excavation and needs an experienced archaeologist to supervise his digs. In 1909, Carnarvon hires Howard Carter to select sites and hire workmen where he feels there are treasures to be found. It is the biggest break in Carter's career. Carnarvon will spend the equivalent of millions of dollars hiring hundreds of laborers and constructing a home for Carter on the edge of the valley. secures the license to dig in the valley that Theodore Davis has surrendered as worthless. Now it's up to Howard Carter to succeed, where others in a century of searching have failed. The labor of his life has begun. Uh, it's true that you may find less in the valley than in any other site in Egypt, but if a lucky strike be made, you will be repaid for years and years of dull and unprofitable work. But the First World War intervenes. Britain and Turkey, Egypt's occupying powers, are enemies at war. All excavation is halted in the Valley of the Kings. Carter, the war affords an opportunity for planning. He studies the record for evidence of a missing king. One name does not appear. I will state that we had definite hopes of finding the tomb of Tutankhamun. We were thoroughly convinced in our own minds that it ought to be situated not far from the center of the valley. Tutankhamun a king who came to the throne of Egypt in an age of turmoil and revolution. Today it's believed that Tutankhamun was the son of radical pharaoh Akhenaten, who declared the disk of the sun to be the only god and ordered that all other gods be forsaken. The result was chaos. For 17 years, Akhenaten ruled a fractured Egypt. One of his wives was Nefertiti, a queen of legendary beauty. But when the pharaoh died, his one god religion died with him. Carter knows Akhenaten's successor was the mysterious Tutankhamun, who ruled for only a few years and then 
vanished from history. In 1917, Egypt is firmly in British hands. Carter can resume his work. Carter's plan is methodical and backbreaking. Using the newly developed wartime technique of grid bombing, he divides the valley into small sections so that no doorway, no staircase can go overlooked. If there is a royal tomb, Howard Carter will find it. Many thousands of tons of surface debris would have to be removed before we could hope to find anything. And even if there was nothing else to go upon, it was a chance we were quite willing to take. Nineteen seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. The Valley's treasures elude Carter, just as they had eluded all who came before him. In 1920, Carnarvon and his daughter, Lady Evelyn, arrived to inspect a meager find of pottery jars and to question the wisdom of continuing the search at all. We had now dug in the valley for several seasons with extremely scanty results, and it became a much debated question whether we should continue the work and try for a more profitable site elsewhere. After all these barren years, were we justified in going on with it? The post-war years have not been kind to the English aristocracy, and digging dry holes in Egypt is an expensive undertaking. Carter is continually afraid of being cut off by his patron. Nineteen twenty. Twenty-one. Carter's makeshift railway has moved thousands of tons of debris, and still nothing of value. In the summer of 1922, Carter must return to England on a visit he is dreading. Carnarvon's patience and his money are running out. But Carter is still convinced he can find the tomb of Tutankhamun. Only a small area remains to be probed. If Tutankhamun lies in the valley, he must be here. Carnarvon relents. He will finance one final dig in the Valley of the Kings. Carter returns to Egypt in November 1922. He brings with him a pet canary whose brilliant plumage amazes his workmen. His servant, Abdel, declares the bird to be an omen of glittering treasure. It is a bird of gold that will bring luck. This year we will find, inshallah, a tomb full of gold. Three days later, Howard Carter rides into the valley as he has a thousand times before. But today, his life will change forever. Let me try to tell the story of it all. The unusual silence made me realize something out of the ordinary had happened. The workers have uncovered a stone staircase just a few yards from a popular tourist attraction the burial chamber of Ramses VI. I almost dared to hope that we had found our tomb at last. Work progressed more rapidly now. Step succeeded step. Toward sunset, there was disclosed the upper part of a doorway. Excitement 
growing to fever heat. I searched the seal impressions on the door for evidence of the identity of the owner, but I could find no name. Was it the actual tomb of the king for whom I'd spent so many years in search? His Egyptian workers call it the tomb of the golden bird. As Carter's canary brought good luck, The next morning, Carter sends an optimistic telegram to Lord Carnarvon in England. At last have made wonderful discovery in the valley. A magnificent tomb with seals intact. Congratulations, Carter. Carter is obliged to wait for his patron to arrive. His spirit swings from excitement to despair. He does not yet know whether he has found a plundered tomb or a magic tunnel to the ancient world. In November 1922, in Egypt's desolate Valley of the Kings, the English archeologist Howard Carter has uncovered a doorway lost for 3,000 years. But what lies behind the sealed door? Is it the fabulous tomb of the golden bird his workmen believe? There was always the horrible possibility that the tomb was an unfinished one, never completed and never used. If it had been finished, there was the depressing probability that it had been completely plundered in ancient times. This agonizing mystery haunts Carter for over two weeks as his patron, Lord Carnarvon, makes his long journey from England, accompanied by his daughter, Lady Evelyn. It is a voyage Carnarvon has made many times before, but now the stakes are at their highest. The train ride up the Nile brings him to the valley that has fueled Carter's obsession for a quarter century and drained Carnarvon's fortune for six frustrating years. On November 23rd, exhausted, yet too exhilarated to rest, they head across the Nile and straight to the work site. The digging continues, the doorway exposed. On it, the seal of Tutankhamun. Carter's perseverance has paid off at last. This instant of triumph, Carter notices something. It is a crushing blow. There had been two successive openings and reclosings of a part of its surface. The tomb then was not absolutely intact as we had hoped. Plunderers had entered it and more than once. The work continues frantically. What lies beyond? filled with rubble and rock. Three days later, the corridor has been cleared. For the first time in 3,000 years, human footsteps echo through this silent passage to the dead. Beyond another sealed door lies a world of riches or of ruins. Trembling hands, I made a tiny breach in the upper left-hand corner. Widening the hole of the door, I appeared in. At first, I could see nothing. Details from the room slowly emerged from the mist. inquired anxiously, can you see anything? It was all I could do to get out the words. Yes, wonderful things.
Inside lies splendor such as modern eyes have never seen. Yet something they sense is missing. It dawned upon our bewildered brains that in all this medley of objects before us, there was no coffin or trace of a mummy. I noticed for the first time that between the two black sentinel statues on the right, there was another sealed doorway. The explanation finally dawned upon us. We were but on the threshold of our discovery. What we saw was merely an antechamber. Behind the guarded door, there were to be other chambers within one of them. We should find the pharaoh lying. within a wall of gold. The untouched clay seals of the ancient priests prove that the tomb robbers never desecrated the royal shrine. Ancient Egypt is about to speak its most sacred secrets. An immutable cosmic order which Pharaoh is both man and God. At Pharaoh's death, the universe is in disarray. Egyptian religion demands that the proper rituals are performed, the incantation spoken, the mummy preserved. Only then can heaven and earth regain their stable rhythm. Hundreds of sovereigns make this divine passage, but only one endures to dazzle modern eyes. Tutankhamun. But before Pharaoh awakes, Carter will endure years of labor, heartbreak, tragedy, and triumph. In the winter of 1922, the discovery of the tomb of Pharaoh Tutankhamun bursts upon the world. Crowds of reporters, tourists, and dignitaries invade the once silent Valley of the Kings. Suddenly, Howard Carter, a distant, solitary man, 
must contend with unending waves of the curious. Despite the mobs, Carter acts with extraordinary patience. He orders that every item in the tomb be meticulously catalogued and conserved. Lord Carnarvon predicts this will keep Carter busy for weeks. In fact, it will consume his life for the next 10 years. A team from New York's Metropolitan Museum is working nearby. Carter hires the museum's photographer, Harry Burton. Every item in the tomb is numbered and photographed by Burton exactly where it is found. Many of the objects in the tomb are heartbreakingly fragile. To conserve them, Carter turns to Arthur Mace, another expert from the Metropolitan Museum. Mace's daughter, Margaret Orr, is the only living eyewitness to this unique and thrilling period. She was nine years old when her father first brought her to Egypt. Well, it, the, the work was so exciting. Just Carter could rely on him. He knew always not only to come in emergencies when there was something very difficult to get up out of the tomb, and he knew my father would always be there and and help. It was always my father who was sent for. The team's task is the most difficult in the history of Egyptology. Slowly, the forgotten pharaoh Tutankhamun reawakens. Objects from the tomb reveal a teenage monarch attended by his queen, Ankhesenamun probably his own half-sister. As the tomb reveals its secrets, the conservators find a tantalizing clue to Tutankhamun's youthfulness. And I remember my mother saying to me, heard from Daddy that they found a child's glove and I'm to go off to Harrods um, with one of your, your gloves that I think is much the same size, he said, uh, because I want to find out the age of the king, if in fact he was a child king. Tutankhamun was a mere child when he attained the throne and just a teenager when he died. Half of the pharaoh's great wealth now belongs to Carnarvon. His triumph incenses Egyptian nationalists who believe Tutankhamun's treasures belong to Egypt. Carnarvon makes the situation even worse, selling exclusive rights to the story to the Times of London, infuriating competing newspapers. The tomb is not his private property. He has not dug up the bones of his ancestors in the Welsh mountains. He has stumbled upon a pharaoh in the land of the Egyptians. To the nationalists, the tomb is not a treasure chest to be plundered. It is the consecrated sepulcher of a great ancestor. The thrill of the discovery has faded. Carter's patience begins to wear thin. Carnarvon treats the tomb like a tourist attraction, throwing picnics for wealthy friends. Carter is furious. We have an opportunity in this tomb such as no archaeologists ever had before. But if we're able to take full advantage of it, it is absolutely essential that we be left to carry on the work without interruption. Half science, half sideshow, the work proceeds. Carter and Carnarvon have told no one of their secret visit to the burial chamber. They've hastily covered up the evidence of their entry.
and in February 1923, they stage a theatrical, formal opening of the chamber for a hand-picked audience of the elite. Block by block, the wall falls away. Behind it, another wall of gold. Within this sealed shrine, another barrier, another golden shrine. As Carter will discover, the second of four standing between him and the Pharaoh. Next to the burial chamber, a treasury of ritual objects to ensure the sacred passage of the dead boy king. Guarding the entrance, Anubis, protector of the king. In this eerie room, another object of astonishing piety and grace. Facing the doorway, Father's side stood the most beautiful monument I had ever seen. It is undoubtedly the canopic chest and contains the jars which play such an important part in the ritual of mummification. Guarded by goddesses, the jars contain the king's internal organs. The walls of the burial chamber illuminate the voyage from death to divine rebirth. The dead king carried in a procession of mourners whose white headbands convey the purity of their grief. The Ankh is bestowed, symbol of eternal life. The blessing of the high priest named Ai, the man who will succeed Tutankhamun as ruler of Egypt. And finally, the boy king embraces Osiris, lord of the underworld. Pharaoh and God are one. Twelve sacred baboons representing the hours of night that presage the sun's daily rebirth, echoed in the rebirth of the king. It is a magnificent discovery. The ancient Egyptian religion warns all who dare defile the tomb of mighty Pharaoh. He who shall injure my tomb, the sun god shall punish him. Any man who shall enter this tomb, I will pounce upon him as on a bird. At this very moment, Howard Carter's canary is swallowed by a cobra, the sacred serpent, protector of the king. At the tomb, one journalist whispers, I give Carnarvon six weeks to live. The legendary curse of Tutankhamun was born. The discovery of the intact tomb of an Egyptian pharaoh is an event of immense scientific importance, but the press focuses on the macabre myth of the mummy's curse. coincidence. Stop if you will, but one thing we know. In the dead king's crypt was this inscription, death shall come with swift wings to him who toucheth the tomb of a pharaoh. It is said that on the day of the official opening, Lord Carnarvon is bitten on the cheek by a mosquito. He nicks the bite while shaving. It becomes infected. And six weeks later, Carnarvon is dead. The official cause of death is pneumonia. But a superstitious world believes it knows what really killed Carnarvon. Black magic from the mummy's tomb. Strange phenomena multiply. A power failure in Cairo at the hour of Carnarvon's demise. The sudden death of the nobleman's favorite dog at his English castle. And of course, the devouring of Howard Carter's pet canary. The myth of King Tut's curse will persist for decades. 
None among the tourists who flocked to view the underground treasure house dreamed that of the 15 who opened it to the world, 12 would meet unnatural deaths within the short span of 10 years, most of them under mysteriously sinister circumstances. The image of an angry mummy becomes a fixture of horror movies and books. While the gullible tell their ghost stories, Howard Carter fights desolation and gloom. He has lost his patron. Lady Evelyn leaves Egypt and soon marries the son of the chairman of Lloyd's of London. At the hour of his greatest discovery, Howard Carter finds himself alone. It takes a full year before he can undertake the most arduous task of all, the dismantling of the Golden Shrines in which Tutankhamun's mummy still lies. It is a time when Carter needs to concentrate undisturbed, but the crowds of the curious grow and grow. In the winter of 1923, Harry Burton and Arthur Mace resume their meticulous labors. Mace's daughter, Margaret Orr, often visited her father's laboratory that season. This was a, a, a very beautiful disused tomb that they turned into a, a workshop, basically. All I remember, really, was my father saying that there should be better ways of looking after things, but the, all they could think of doing at that time was pouring melted wax on the things to keep them together, you know, before they were moved. Because everything was so terribly fragile, and he showed me all this. And then he said, I think you'll like the chariots best. And I certainly did. Um, the carving was absolutely lovely. Each side of the seat, there were these figures. Even I then could just stand looking at them, trying to pick out the different types of faces. And it just struck me as very romantic, this young boy king sitting in this beautiful, very golden chariot. Uh, going roaring over the desert, you know, that really captured my imagination. Carter's team soon learns that Tutankhamun lies within a series of ornamented shrines. For 12 weeks, working in stifling conditions, they disassemble the royal mausoleum, until finally the doors of the fourth and last shrine are swung open. We were to witness a spectacle as no other man in our times has been privileged to see. The decisive moment was at hand. The doors slowly swung open, and there, filling the entire area within, stood an immense yellow sarcophagus, intact with the lid still firmly fixed in its place, just as the pious hands had left it. On the lid, Carter finds an inscription. May he inside be uninjured the son of Ra, Tutankhamun. On February 12th, 1924, before another crowd of invited dignitaries, Carter is ready at last to remove the massive lid of the sarcophagus. I gave the word. Amid silence, the huge slab weighing over a ton and a quarter rose from its bed. The light shone into the sarcophagus. The contents were completely covered by fine linen shrouds. A gasp of wonderment escaped our lips. So gorgeous was the sight that met our eyes. The golden effigy of the young boy king of the most magnificent workmanship filled the whole of the interior of the sarcophagus. This should be his moment of supreme triumph. Instead, it is the beginning of a confrontation that will drive Howard Carter out of the Valley of the Kings. In Cairo, a new government of Egyptian nationalists sees Tutankhamun as the perfect symbol of Egyptian majesty and power. When Carter proposes that the wives of his colleagues, not a group of visiting Egyptian officials, should be the next to enter the tomb, the government denies permission. 
Carter is outraged. He padlocks the entranceway. Carter dictates a public letter to the Egyptian authorities. Owing to the impossible restrictions and discourtesies of the Egyptians' public works department, all my colleagues have refused to work any further upon their scientific investigations in the tomb. The government gives Carter 48 hours to surrender the key. He refuses. Time runs out. The Egyptians make good on their threat. They send an armed force to his home. The ministers were to go down and take the locks, break the locks, and take over the tomb. Uh, Carter was therefore on edge and must have said to my father, come with me, because I, I'm really feeling so depressed and sad about this. And I think it might be tonight. How extraordinary that the Egyptians decided they'd got to bring an army to take the locks away from one defenseless little man. It is archaeology's first labor strike and Howard Carter's biggest mistake. He is to leave Egypt not knowing if he will ever gaze upon the face of Tutankhamun. Reluctantly, Carter agrees to a lecture tour of North America. The tour makes him wealthy and famous, but privately, Carter is confused and defeated. On that outer lid was a tiny wreath of flowers. It leads us to think the last farewell offering of the widow girl queen to her husband. I shall retire renouncing any claims whatsoever to the Tutankhamun discovery, and also from future archaeological research with a broken heart. In art, in fashion, in music, and movies, King Tut is the boy of the hour. Tut mania is born. Carter returns to England in the summer of 1924. At the Wembley exhibition of the Empire's achievements, a full-sized recreation of Tutankhamun's tomb has been installed without Carter's knowledge or approval. Carter attempts to sue, but backs down. Tut's tomb is the hit of the fair. In the Valley of the Kings, the real tomb remains locked. Even the Egyptians concede that only Howard Carter is qualified to proceed with the unveiling of the king's sacred coffin and the mummy within. Pharaoh's sleep remains unbroken, but soon dramatic events will bring Carter back to Egypt. He will gaze upon the face of Tutankhamun. In November 1924, a terrorist bomb kills Sir Lee Stack, Britain's high-ranking official in Egypt. Britain retaliates by forcing the nationalist government to resign and installing a new government, sympathetic to British interests. Carter returns to the valley in December. But the rules have changed. His future work will be supervised by Egyptian officials. As the work resumes in the Valley of the Kings, Howard Carter's moment of truth is at hand. Within the sarcophagus, the sheer magnificence of the artistry continues to astound Carter as coffin within coffin is revealed. It was a moment as anxious as exciting. 
The lid came up fairly readily, revealing a second magnificent anthropoid coffin covered with a thin gossamer sheet. Underneath this covering, in places, glimpses could be obtained of rich, multicolored glass decoration encrusted upon the fine gold work of the coffin. We could now gaze with admiring eyes upon the finest example of the ancient coffin maker's art ever yet seen. It presented a wonderful picture of majesty lying in state. Ritual oils used by the priests to anoint Pharaoh's remains have turned as hard as rock. Even after they are melted away, the weight of the remaining coffin puzzles Carter until he discovers why. The third coffin was made of solid gold. How great must have been the wealth buried with those ancient pharaohs? What riches that valley must have once concealed? For 30 years, Howard Carter has dreamed of this moment. Inside the golden coffin, another unexpected treasure, and the most glorious of all. The golden mask adorning the mummy of Tutankhamun. At such moments, the emotions evade verbal expression, complex and stirring as they are. 3,000 years and more had elapsed since men's eyes had gazed into that golden coffin. Time, measured by the brevity of human life, seemed to lose its common perspectives before a spectacle so vividly recalling the solemn religious rites of a vanished civilization. More than 150 dazzling pieces of jewelry, almost all of them gold, placed on the king's body precisely as described in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. The youthful pharaoh was before us at last, an obscure and ephemeral ruler, ceasing to be the mere shadow of a name, had re-entered after more than 3,000 years the world of reality and history. At the touch of a sable brush, the last few fragments of decayed fabric fell away, revealing a serene and placid countenance, that of a young man. The face was refined and cultured, the features well-formed. The tomb had yielded its secret. The message of the past had reached the present, in spite of the weight of time and the erosion of so many years. For Howard Carter, only one question remains. Why did the boy king die so young? After unmasking his beloved pharaoh Tutankhamun, Howard Carter wonders, how did the boy king die? In the great temple at Karnak, there is one statue whose face resembles the image on the golden mask of Tutankhamun. But the king's name has been replaced with that of his successor, stricken from life and death. And Carter suspects the young monarch was murdered murdered perhaps by the very priest who anointed him in his golden tomb. Recent x-rays reveal a small bone fragment within the king's skull, possible evidence of murder. Tutankhamun may have been the final casualty of his father Akhenaten's one god revolution, killed by priests anxious to restore the old religion. For seven more years, Howard Carter patiently studies and conserves the majestic contents of the tomb of Tutankhamun, preparing them for exhibition at the Great Cairo Museum, a collection that over the past 30 years has toured America, Europe, Russia, and Japan, captivating millions with the most dazzling artifacts of the ancient world. Egypt, 
retelling the tale of his great discovery to any tourist who will listen. Carter dies, unhonored and forgotten in his own time. It is an ironic end for the man who had discovered Tutankhamun, a minor and forgotten pharaoh. Carter resurrected the lost king only to share his fate. But today, of all Egypt's great pharaohs, only Tutankhamun's name resonates on the path.